This channel is part of the History Hit Network. In 1839, lured by rumors of a fantastic lost city, American explorer and diplomat John Lloyd Stevens hacked his way into the thick mountain jungles of Honduras. The rumors hinted of a great Maya city, full of great monuments and strange carvings, built and then abandoned long before the white man set foot on New World soil. But even the tall tales he had heard could not prepare Stevens for the ghostly presence that loomed up before him. It lay before us like a shattered bark in the midst of the oceans. Her masts were gone, her crew perished. All was mystery, dark, impenetrable mystery. What sophisticated race had built the elegant city which lay before him, still nearly intact? Where had they gone? Most perplexing of all were the strange, chaotic carvings that adorned the temples. Were they some sort of language? But here, as at other Maya ruins, their mystery remained impenetrable. The carvings defied translation just as the pyramids resisted explanation. Stymied scholars resorted to imagination, sketching a picture of the Maya as a peaceful, contemplative people thriving under the watchful eye of wise astronomer priests. The scholars were wrong, dead wrong. Today's archaeologists working in the jungles of Central America have come to know a quite different Maya. They've cracked their code and the ancient peoples have found their voice again. In the once mighty city of Copan, hieroglyphs speak of war, blood ritual and human sacrifice. Who then were these people? And what apocalypse brought their great dynasty to its knees? When I walked among its temples, I did not see a pile of stone, but I thought, Washak Lahun Ubak Awil built this. He dedicated that ball court. And I began to understand all of those works, not as the relics of a dead civilization, but as the fossils of the human beings, the minds of the people who had created them. Copan came alive. When Linda Sheely first walked into the jungles of Central America back in the late 1960s, Maya scholarship was in its infancy. The Maya had tamed the rainforests, growing corn and cacao beans, much as their descendants do today. They built great cities at Tikal, Yaxalan, Chichen Itza, and Palenque. They traded in precious stones such as jade, fashioned some of the finest sculpture in the New World, and built pyramids to rival those of the Egyptian pharaohs. Beyond that, there was still much to learn. Scholars had resorted to a wishful thinking that spoke more eloquently of their own times than those of the Maya. From the period of the 1930s up through the 60s, uh, the great scholars of the time, Morley, Thompson, and others characterized my society as, as having basically two groups of people, a whole bunch of peasant farmers who supported a very tiny elite who spent their lives contemplating the stars and time and living in ceremonial centers that were filled once or twice a year during great ritual festivals. Uh, the picture that was drawn of the Maya is that they never had war they never disagreed with each other. And one wonders how they got close enough to each other even to reproduce themselves uh, through the common human means. People clung to that idea tenaciously. And I think part of the reason for that is they were reacting to all of the excesses and the maladies of Western culture. You have to remember that their context was that of two world wars, where literally the whole world was involved in a death deadly conflict. They wanted a peaceful people. They wanted to know that someplace in the world there was a human community that lived without war and competition. For 15 years, archaeologist Bill Fash and his colleagues have continued and expanded excavation techniques that allow them to reconstruct the monuments even as they dissect them. In the past, archaeologists at Maya sites had no choice but to dismantle the grand monuments, layer by layer, to get at older structures obscured by the more recent ones. But at Copan, 
the archaeologists have created a delicate labyrinth of tunnels through the ruins, leaving them virtually intact. Since the building of the Acropolis was a matter of layers upon layers upon layers, or as some have commented, it's like boxes inside of boxes, the easiest way to get from one to the next is by the tunneling. The world of the tunnels is like three-dimensional. And it's, it's, it's very different because you can go up, down, or sideways. You can move in every direction. If we had to do a traditional archaeological excavation of the Copan Acropolis, we'd have to destroy half of everything we dug. But with tunneling, we're able to just do surgical strikes. It's as if we're doing arthroscopic surgery, and we can just go in there with just very small excavations to exactly the point we want and get a maximum of information for a minimum of disturbance to the archaeological site. The tunneling's been vital to understanding the history of ancient Copan. We have the hieroglyphs that tell us about the kings, but the tunneling tell us about the buildings that were constructed by each of these rulers. We were one day away from, from giving up here. We had, found, we had found the cut, and I took one look of it, at it with my flashlight, and I could see um, femur fragments and uh, some of the shell and the two stones, and it just clicked immediately that it, it was not only this huge chamber, but that um, it had to be something very important. Through the tunneling, we've discovered a part of the offering that was actually placed above the tomb. This was a big surprise. We didn't think we were going to find any human figures here. It's the largest tomb we've ever found in Copan. Clearly, these were the tombs of noblemen, perhaps kings. But their identities remain a mystery. If there are clues to the dead man's identity, they likely reside in the walls of Copan's monuments, in the hieroglyphs that for so long remained obstinately silent. But only in the last few years has the language come alive. For the first time in a millennium, classic Maya can be heard among the jungle ruins. And what is being spoken has radically altered our view of the people who wrote on these walls. We went from talking about uh, empty ceremonial centers which held only uh, uh, priests, basically, and people living in little hamlets on the outside who would come in on Sunday to peddle their corn, you know, to s some large urban centers, to understanding the fact that these cities, like Copan, who has over 20,000 people living with the same kind of pollution that we get today in our cities. We now understand that the Maya were really much more like everybody else's. They're much more human. They were much more human than we had imagined them. With the breaking of the Maya Code, the picture of these people as peaceful stargazers crumbled. The great kings of Copan led their people in bloody battles against their neighbors. We know that the Maya were like any other, quote, civilized group of people. They had a lot of war. They had a lot of conflicts with their neighbors. They were always jockeying for position to see who could be the biggest and the most powerful ruler of his time. To be a great and virile king, you had to go out and impose your will on somebody else by the use of force. You can see this in the depictions here on this figure. There are upside down human heads, shrunken heads actually, that are trophy heads, that are the bounty of war. You can even see the ropes that they use to tie these heads together. The hieroglyphs tell again and again of human sacrifice and self-mutilation. But to the Maya, they ensured continuation of their cosmos. The most sacred substance was human blood, especially a king's blood. Led in auto-sacrificial ritual was the greatest gift that a king could offer to the gods and to his ancestors. There are a number of sites where child sacrifices have been found. It was thought that the baby's tears would bring the rainwater from the sky. So a lot of sacrifice was oriented toward fertility, toward ensuring that the natural cycles took their course and that the harvest would be bounteous and the people would be happy. There are two great acts that kings consistently presented in the public forum. One is the taking of captives. The other is the taking and the offering of the king's own blood in ritual uh, sacrifice taken from the most sacred areas of his own body uh, for a male the genitals, for the female and the male, it's the tongue. It's the place where human beings reproduce themselves and the place where speech is made, where meaning is communicated from one person to another. 
Uh, Bloodletting was the central act of piety. Now, why? One kind of soul is called chulel. It is a, a sacred living substance that is in our bodies that is never destroyed. It's passed on from you to future generations. That kind of soul resides in human blood. So that when kings give victims of war in sacrifice, or when they take blood for themselves, they are all giving the most potent and the most important valuable substance on the face of the earth. Our culture says the same thing. What do we say? Greater love hath no man than he give his life for his brother. Bloodletting marked each celebration in the calendar and each rite of passage in the life of the Maya. The birth of a child, the consecration of a temple, the preparation for battle, and the thanksgiving for victory. Even Maya sport was fraught with cosmic importance. Copan's magnificent ball court, one of the best preserved in the Maya world, witnessed intricate morality plays in the guise of athletic competition. The ball was seen to represent the passage of the sun in the sky, and much of the ball game was oriented toward ensuring the safe and timely passage not only of the sun through the sky, but of the moon and the planets and so forth. The ball game is the fundamental metaphor of what life was. In this myth, two hero twins go to the other world. There, they confront the lords of death. Disease, starvation, warfare, all of the confrontation is played out in the ball court. The king dressed up to play ball, embodying the forces of good, and he faced players who were dressed up to embody the forces of evil. So that when the king would defeat those people, he was in fact defeating all the things that could hurt his people. In this competition of life over death, the losers sometimes paid the ultimate price. Oftentimes there are very clear depictions of the sacrifice of ball players. In fact, sometimes they even bind the losers up as a ball and show them being rolled down steps just like these. So we do know that some people were sacrificed in order to ensure the victory of the forces of good ended in the sacrifice of the loser. For hundreds of years, the blood pact between the kings of Copan and their subjects seemed to have stood them in good stead. Copan flourished. By 600, Copan and her sister cities were unrivaled centers of art and learning. From among the 15,000 works of Copan art collected here in the last decade, art historian Barbara Fash finds the works created during 18 Rabbits' reign particularly beautiful. The buildings may have served a function uh, that was utilitarian, but the iconography on the outside of it, the sculpture that was being produced at that time, just raised it to an artistic, aesthetic height that is really unprecedented in Copan and, and in many other places in the Maya area. In the history of the Renaissance, not very many people know the name of the Pope Julius. But Julius was the man that commissioned Michelangelo, Raphael, and Leonardo to leave us one of the greatest artistic heritages of the West. 18 Rabbit was the great patron of Copan, and he hired, commissioned, and gave uh, the room to work to some of the greatest artists the Mayas ever had. 18 Rabbit ruled for 43 years. His sculptures, replete with themes of fertility and abundance, speak of a period of peace through strength, giving no hint of the disaster to come. 18 Rabbit is in the guise of first father, the Maze God, and he is the creator of the universe. He and his wife, who was the moon and first mother, wear the netted skirt. That whole myth is contained in the life cycle of a piece of, of a maize tree. The little seeds that are put in the ground are called skulls and little bones. And when the, the maize tree sprouts from the ground, it's the rebirth of the, of the maize god and it's the rebirth of humanity, because that is the last act before the creation of this universe.
In 738, an aging 18 rabbit set out on one more conquest to do away with a troublesome neighbor. He was captured and beheaded, an earth-shattering blow to his people. This is the great hieroglyphic stairway of Copan, begun not long after 18 Rabbit's gruesome death. The longest and most ornate inscription in the New World, the Grand Stairway records the complete history of the Copan dynasty. Its magnificent present testifies to a society quickly recovering from the blow of a great king's death, but the excavations reveal a more ominous story. One of the most telling things about this monument is that even though it makes all these wonderful and grandiose claims, it was actually one of the worst constructed buildings in the entire city. The fill underneath this magnificent facade was the weakest they ever put inside of a building in Copan. That lets us know that the people who were building this pyramid were not nearly as enthusiastic about its message as the king who commissioned it. As more and more kingdoms established themselves, they wanted their piece of the pie. And it led to a lot of internal strife that often was re resolved in uh, battle. So first we see a weakening of the central order. Second is the actual collapse of the monarchical system of government. And that's literally all she wrote. There are no more monuments going up in Copan. Copan had gone from a thriving, peaceful center of art and commerce to a valley of desperate people struggling to feed themselves. For physical anthropologist turned forensic detective Rebecca Story, the bones of Copan yield a grim prognosis. Most of them probably died of the results of the overpopulation. That is, malnutrition and infection work together to kill many children, and even the adults that survive eventually ended up dying of the effects of infection. By the time this individual was there, the population of the valley was probably in steep decline. Some 20,000 people were hungry or sick in the Valley of Copan. How could it have happened that this thriving metropolis was reduced to this? They set up the city on the most fertile agricultural lands, down on the bottomlands that the river had carved out and made fertile over the centuries. By doing so, they were basically cutting off their own food supply. They weren't able to farm the best lands. They were then obliged to cut down the forest on the slopes. In doing so, that caused erosion. As they had to cut back even higher up, this made for deforestation on a large scale that prevented the rain clouds from coming into the valley. And they provoked the collapse of the central authority first, but they also provoked the long-term abandonment of the valley because people simply couldn't get enough to eat here anymore. The evidence suggests that the city grew rank with its own waste, that there was not a tree standing within 25 miles, and that the overworked soil could not begin to feed the hungry multitudes who lived there. Copan had become a victim of its own success. For nearly a thousand years, the kings of Copan upheld a blood covenant with their gods and their people. The Maya prospered. They built great monuments, deciphered the heavens, created objects of great beauty. But when their world began to collapse, even the blood of kings could not forestall disaster. In just a generation, the monarchy stumbled. Soon the great city would lie empty, reclaimed by the jungle. Most of us who deal with the Maya think Maya civilization either ended at the collapse in the ninth century, or it was destroyed by the Spanish invasion. But in fact, there are millions of Maya who still live in this worldview. It's still alive, it's still active, it's still incredibly productive. And what they have found is that the actions of their lives have roots that go back 3,000 years. And for our people who have been told that they are the ersatz leftover folk Catholic product of a European power, and that they have no value in themselves and they have no history, to have the glyphs put back in their hands is a miracle. And they say it is. Today, with the hieroglyphs pouring out their stories, Copan is yielding a rich human history. It's important to recognize and absorb the fact that one of the oldest 
continuous and most detailed written history of the human species is Maya, and it is written on those stones. You feel attached to the bones that are here, you know, you feel attached to the monuments that are here. They're ancestors, you know, they're still a part of our history, you know, and we're not excavating somebody else's, we're excavating our own history. Uh, this is of significance to our own people. It's unraveling the roots of our nation. I was only gonna be here for a year and I've been here 15, so to say how long, um, I think I'm gonna stay for a long time. Copan is in my blood.